I'm very, very, very pleased to welcome Sheila Jeffries, who's going to give our first talk. Um, Sheila Jeffries is an academic and activist and has written 12 books about women's rights, uh, women's liberation, lesbian feminism, and uh, is a founder member of WDI, Women's Declaration International. She's written uh, several books on transgenderism and on gender. And uh, she's now going to give us a talk, We Can't Save Gender and Abolish Transgenderism. So welcome, Sheila. Thank you very much for coming. In the wonderful international and broad feminist campaign against the politics of gender identity that we are all involved in, there is an unspoken issue that I consider to be of huge importance. And this is whether we can effectively oppose this men's rights movement if we do not recognize that the problem of men imitating women is integrally bound up with the practices of subordination that women are required to adopt under male domination. These practices are called femininity or gender, and it is this that transvestites imitate. I will use the term transvestites to apply to the men who are masochistically sexually excited by doing what they call gender expression or wearing women's knickers. I use this term because it's the term used throughout the 20th century by the sexologists, the scientists of sex, to refer to men with this particular sexual fetish. And it's important not to use language which suggests that men can really become women by some alchemical process. The vast majority of men who have gender identities are just those who are excited by such things as shaving their legs in front of the mirror, for instance, a practice that symbolizes subordination for them. As our new feminist movement develops, and it is developing and it's very exciting, Many women are joining who are fiercely determined to oppose the gender identity rights movement, and, and it's good to see this. And many of these new feminists, though, are newly involved and not aware of the full extent of the radical feminist critique of gender. They may see their activism on this issue as quite separate from the ways in which women are expected to dress, depilate, make up, and so on. If the femininity that women do is seen as separate, somehow more real than that which men do, the problem of transvestism could be seen as men unreasonably muscling in on practices that are naturally those of women, rather than engaging in sexual play with women's oppression. Men who adopt gender identities engage in a variety of behaviors they associate with women. They pretend to have female body parts or try to acquire them by surgery, including wombs, which some surgeons are now seeking to offer. They imitate what they see as women's behavior, such as knitting. There's quite a fascination with pink knitting. They adopt what they see as feminine ways of holding their bodies, taking up space. And of course, they engage in what they see as women's beauty practices. All of these things give sexual satisfaction. And of course, it can be very hard for them to hide their erections when they're engaged in them. I shall talk today about their adoption of what they call femininity, i.e. clothes, makeup, beauty practices such as depilation, ways of moving, sitting and standing that they see as appropriate for women. The difference between men doing femininity and women doing femininity is not that men do it for masochistic sexual excitement and women do it naturally. Men do do it for masochistic sexual excitement, that is true. But women do it because of cultural requirements and various degrees of force often applied from a very early age. There is nothing natural about it. You have probably seen little girls in parks standing at the bottom of trees while their brothers play in the branches. I certainly have. The girls are wearing short skirts, which will impede movement and show their knickers if they try to climb, and their parents will likely discourage them. They will probably also have unsuitable shoes. These little girls are crippled in their adventurousness, their comfort in movement and their bodies, and ultimately, I would argue, their minds from a very early age. These constraints create brain binding for female children. Now, 
This is just an example of transgender resources online. To see what the transvestites understand to be the practices of femininity, it's useful to consult the resources available online. There are very many training websites, videos and courses online for transvestites as part of the now immense industry of transgenderism, which services these men's fetishes from knickers with holes for the penis to pink dummies for adult babies. They offer a great deal of information about what they understand femininity to entail and make it clear they see it to be about subordination. The website Susan's Place, for instance, gives advice to men on how to imitate the way women walk. Women are told, for instance, that they should rest their forearm on their shoulder bag. It says, rest your forearm on it with a limp wrist, something women often forget to do, I suspect. Men are advised on how to wear high heel shoes because these are very important to womanhood. They should, the website says, let the ankle wobble. This is a natural tendency, let it happen. If the ankle wobbles, it shows weakness, a truly feminine characteristic. Keeping the ankle stiff will be a dead giveaway as it just doesn't look very feminine. So there you have it. Femininity is simply weakness. So it is very sexually exciting for a masochist to adopt it. On these sites, men are trained in how to sit. It's explained that taking up space is about power. So only men should do that. Only men should man spread, for instance. When they're being women, they must try to take up very little space. They must keep their knees together or cross their legs. There is a great deal of evidence that men adopt what they see as feminine behaviors, shoes, clothing, makeup, because it represents the delights of masochism for them. They are voluntarily humiliating themselves and prepared to put a lot of time into learning how to do it. Every instruction as well as every step in painful shoes can give them delicious erections. Nonetheless, there are women, even feminists, who do not see these practices as being culturally imposed upon themselves as part of their subordination. They see them as unacceptable only if men adopt them, but for women, they see them as natural and about choice. This is not surprising. Women are indoctrinated their whole lives by popular culture, parents, educators, the law, medicine, religion, in the naturalness of femininity. It could feel very confronting, even scary, to step out into the strange world of bare-faced women with their feet on the ground and face being ignored or traduced by men for their disobedience. Now, I want to talk about femininity. The feminists who consider that we um, oppose transgenderism without opposing femininity may not be aware that the critique of beauty practices lies at the very foundation of radical feminism. So I'll go over this now. It's the understanding of radical feminism that what is seen under male domination as natural and inevitable, the behaviors of femininity and masculinity, actually represent a system of power relations. Masculinity is the behavior of male power, it is the behavior of comfort, dignity, the taking up of space, the right to keep the body covered and not have to perform what I call the sexual corvée. And it represents power and authority and full human status. Femininity, on the other hand, is the behavior of female subordination. It includes performing what I call the sexual corvée. The sexual corvée consists of the range of practices that women are culturally expected to perform on their bodies in order to show their second class status and sexually excite their overseers, the dominant sex class of men. I call it the sexual corvée in reference to the corvée which was performed by the peasants in Europe under the political system of feudalism. Corvée is the system commonly used throughout history, but best known from the time of feudalism in Europe, in which the peasants or serfs were required to work the land of the landowner for a certain number of days yearly with no pay so that the landlord could profit. Women are required to do all of this work to themselves. 
Women are required to do complex and painful things to their bodies, as well as buying the toxic chemicals with which to do them. And of course, they don't get paid for any of this. The shopping costs women time and money, but the work of application takes a great deal of time too. A study by Marks and Spencers estimated that the average woman takes 20 minutes per day doing ordinary makeup and 40 minutes for going out socializing. That is, as I always explain, several years in a lifetime and quite enough to learn a difficult language like Korean, which would be much more useful. There are many other activities required which all take time, depilation, eyebrow threading, the application of full snails in beauty parlors and bleaching, and um, anal bleaching rather, pumping up lips and other parts of the body with fillers, tattooing, piercing, Botox. The array of treatments that women have to pay to have applied to their body, most of which are painful and take a good deal of time is very extensive. Men on the other hand may skip out of the door in the morning barefaced, having done nothing to transform themselves, having done nothing to please women's eyes or to show their deference. I argue, that the beauty practices required of women should be included within the United Nations understanding of harmful cultural practices. Harmful cultural practices are those which do not fit easily into conventional understandings of women's rights or into the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. The paradigmatic harmful cultural practice is female genital mutilation. The practices are defined by being harmful to women and girls, performed for the benefit of men, and justified by tradition. Beauty practices fit these criteria, though they're not usually included in the lists in UN documents, which include such practices as child marriage and breast ironing and so on. The UN concept of harmful cultural practices is created out of a cultural bias. Therefore, it does not include any practices which take place in Western countries because women are educated in the West and seem to have a choice. In fact, of course, there are plenty of harmful cultural practices in the West which are not alleviated by a higher standard of living and education. The bodies of women and girls are cut up in the West in ways that suit the interests of men and male power and are brutal even compared with those in Africa or the Middle East. Breast augmentation is a vicious and dangerous practice, as is labiaplasty, in which women have parts of their labia removed to make them resemble the women in pornography more closely. And because the new regime required of women in the West, in which their vulvas are shaved, reveals what masculine culture considers undesirable. Presently, teenage girls are being subjected to drug and surgical treatment to make them into boys under a woman-hating idea that has taken over the culture, that girls who reject beauty practices cannot really be female and must have their bodies attacked and altered at all costs. These practices are just as brutal as many of those seen as unacceptable elsewhere, such as placing bands around the necks of girls to give them giraffe necks, or isolating them in menstruation huts when they're bleeding, or fattening them up for marriage. All of these practices, whether in the East or the West, are culturally imposed upon women and girls. Men only engage in them in very unusual circumstances, usually for sexual satisfaction. The harmful cultural practices approach understands beauty practices as a tool and imposition of male domination, rather than something natural, essentially and uniquely the domain and pleasure of women. It is a political rather than an individual explanation. This explanation goes against everything though that girls and women are taught and can be quite hard for many women to accept. Some will say that in fact they choose depilation, high-heeled shoes, makeup or other harmful practices. There is increasing understanding among many feminists that it's unreasonable to explain practices of violence against women such as pornography or prostitution as being the result of women's choice. The liberal feminist approach, in which harms to women are blamed upon women through saying it's women's choice, obscures the forces of male domination which set up these industries and induct women and girls into them for men's satisfaction. In relation to harmful cultural practices, arguments as to choice are not really relevant. 
in the UN understanding. They are seen as imposed culturally upon women and girls in such a way that there is no room for choice. The overwhelming expectation of the beauty industry, women's media, family, workplaces, popular culture, and the everyday demands of men create a cultural imperative that women and girls engage in them. Another example of a harmful cultural practice imposed upon women is the requirement of nakedness. Probably the clearest indication of difference in status between men and women is that women are expected to show the entirety of their buttocks in swimwear and men wear board shorts. But I'll talk about everyday shorts because I think there's less recognition of the shocking nature of the difference here. So basically, um, under male domination, nakedness symbolizes lack of power, lack of dignity, and women are forced to be at least partly naked. Men are not naked because being clothed symbolizes power and dignity, and men are clothed. The, the differences are really, 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 really clear. You know, walk down any street into any room and you will see the difference between nakedness, not nakedness. Now, women are generally required to wear shorts that are tighter and with short leg lengths, in some cases exposing parts of the buttocks, because these please men's eyes and are seen as suitable for the class of women which has less claim to dignity. What other reason could there be for men's shorts being six inches longer than those of women almost always? Actually, I think here they're a bit longer. I see heterosexual couples approaching the beach in the seaside town in which I live, and the shorts of the men and women are a study in power difference. So you see here, Harry and Megan in their new Netflix doco. Fortunately, this photograph was in the newspaper this morning and I thought it was very suitable. Uh, you see that poor Megan has to expose all of her thighs and wear quite tight clothes uh, because, of course, looseness is about dignity and tightness is about showing men your body. Whereas Harry, who is both in the ruling class in terms of being um, royal, as well as in the ruling class, as well as being a man, can have loose clothes, covering clothes and be uh, and feel dignified. Now, feminine uh, beauty practices serve two main purposes. They mark out the members of the inferior sex class so that everyone knows who is the man. In this way, they create sexual difference. In a hierarchical system, it's very important to know who is on the top and who is on the bottom. Beauty practices mark out persons worthy of respect and those who are not. Also, they're designed to create sexual excitement, to make of the public world, as I argue, an outdoor brothel. They enable men to exist in a fever of arousal at work, on public transport, in the street. In a book called The Psychology of Clothes from the 1930s, for instance, a psychologist named Flugel explained that when a man heard the sound of a woman's high heels behind him walking down the street, he would go into the first stage of, of arousal. I presume that means erection. So men uh, admit themselves very clearly what these beauty practices do for them and the excitements that they create. Women's performance of, of femininity is a practice of deference. It shows humility and obedience to their social superiors, the sex class of men. And women who refuse to show deference do get punished. It may be simply a men saying, as they used to in the workplace when I was young, and maybe they're not allowed to now, that it would be lovely to see their workmates' legs, or if she once wears a skirt, that it is lovely to see her legs. That may not happen anymore, but it certainly used to happen. I uh, can't imagine anything like that being said to men. Um, thus, um, women are trained into obedience. If you refuse to comply, men will deliver quite imaginative insults. Uh, for instance, on a men's rights website, I was described as looking like a bulldog, which is fine for me because I very much like dogs. Now, I became fully aware of the way the pressure upon women to express deference works when I had a fascinating conver con conversation with a woman I met when I gave a talk in Queensland to the Women's Business Association Zonta. She was wearing lipstick and she was in her 60s. She told me that she'd been a strong feminist in her youth and did not wear lipstick, 
but started to wear it at the age of 60 because she realized she had become invisible. I told her she was not invisible to me. I enjoyed talking to her and found her very interesting, but she was not interested in being visible to women. She meant that men now ignored her. She was probably used to some attention because she'd been attractive in a way that men valued. But in age, she needed to make a gesture of availability to bring back their attention. And this was an extraordinarily uh, clear indication to me of the enormous pressure on women to get men's attention and to do the practices that will get that attention. Lipstick, um, I have explained elsewhere, was associated with uh, prostitution in the West until the 1920s. Two historians of prostitution have explained that lipstick was first adopted in the period of the Ur of the Cordes, Babylon, by prostituted women. These women were slaves and made their lips look like engorged labia to indicate that they would perform oral sex. It was a marketing device. It only became ubiquitous in the West in the 20th century, in the period between the two world wars. My mother did not wear it in youth, but felt obliged to adopt it as an older woman. And in fact, uh, if I went out of the door wearing uh, lipstick in my teens, my father would say to me, you look like a whore. And there's nothing chosen about a practice which is now seen as necessary for women to be to feel visible, meaning visible to men. That's not a chosen practice. Now, I want to talk about where the um, radical feminist approach came from, how it first became a crucial part of our movement. Um, feminists started the women's liberation movement, of course, in the 1970s by protesting beauty pageants and argued fiercely that women should not have to serve as sex objects for men. This uh, picture is from Andrea Dworkin's book, Woman Hating, from 1974. So it's very early on. And what she, uh, what's in this picture, which she got done for her book, is it shows all the different practices that done to, are done to all the different bits of women's bodies. It's a handy diagram because you can work out what everybody is supposed to do from there, what women are supposed to do. Now, some things have changed, but mostly through the adding of even more painful and humiliating practices, rather than any relaxation of the demands. Uh, nails, for instance, have to be rendered unfit for every ordinary use today, not just with painting, which was the case uh, um, in my day, painting with hazardous chemicals and shaping, but with the addition in a vast network of nail salons of fake nails, which are extraordinarily long and would make it impossible to caress a child, a pet or a lover, and certainly render getting dressed or cooking well nigh impossible. I mean, so now women can find that all their extremities are crippled, crippled by shoes at one end, crippled by nails on their hands and so on. The diagram only suggests that the mouth must be lipstick, but now there is a new fashion for women to plump up their lips. They use various chemicals so that they look even more precisely like in gorge labia. And they can even be dyed so that they're permanently luscious, sexualized, dark red. I think you probably have noticed that a lot of women have rather extraordinary lips on the television these days, <clears throat> sticking out in a very strange manner. And of course, the, using all of these, these chemicals and practices can be very dangerous and very harmful and very damaging. Now, a whole array of practices has been developed to enable women to look more like the women in pornography who have labiaplasties, who shave their genitals and so on. Now, both of those practices are normalized, as has anal bleaching. I remember I was in a classroom talking about uh, beauty practices, doing my lecture on beauty practices. And I said to my students, who always taught me a great deal, uh, is there perhaps a practice that's quite new? This must have been 10 years ago or, or more. And one student put her hand up and said, um, anal bleaching. And I thought, I didn't know about that. I actually didn't know. So women are having to bleach their anuses so that they look nice to be looked at. Now, uh, Andrew Dworkin sees beauty practices as having extensive harmful effects on women's bodies and lives. 
beauty practices, she says, are not only time wasting, expensive, painful to self-esteem. In fact, she says, standards of beauty describe in precise terms the relationship that an individual will have to her own body. They prescri proscribe her mobility, think high heeled shoes and tight skirts, her spontaneity, her posture, her gait, the uses to which she can put her body. And I do think that having the body constrained in this way must in the end affect the way that you are able to think, the boundaries of your imagination. And she says that these practices define precisely the dimensions of her physical freedom. It's crucial, I think, to that understanding. Because I do wonder how women are able to be totally imaginative, creative, create a new future for themselves in their minds if their bodies are tied down and completely constricted. Beauty practices aren't just some kind of interesting optional choice or extra. They fundamentally construct who a woman is and therefore how she's able to imagine because they construct, constrict her movements. They create the way in which she experiences her body and effect the binding of her mind. Right, this picture is also a little bit small, but you may be able to see me in it. I am sitting in the line just behind the table, third in from the right, with my hand around the side of my face, looking extremely depressed, I think it's reasonable to say. Uh, this was a student ball in about 1968. And the reason that I thought it was good to put this picture in is because uh, some people might think that, you know, us radical feminists, us lesbian feminists fall, you know, fully formed from the body of the goddess and that we were never down there doing beauty practices with other women. Well, of course, we were down there doing beauty practices with other women. You can see I've got this um, long straight hair, which was also bleached, it was bleached mid golden sable. I had lots of different kinds of makeup on my eyes, probably false eyelashes as well, and so on. So certainly I did all of those things. And I was one of those feminists in the 1970s whose life was transformed by the radical feminist analysis. The first feminist act many, many women engaged in was to give up beauty practices. Often this was done by stages. The first act might be to give up makeup, I can remember going into the Students' Union building at the University of Manchester after reading Kate Millett's Sexual Politics and becoming a feminist. I had no makeup on, deliberately did that, and seriously believed that no one would recognize me. I was so wedded to makeup at that time and did not go out without it. I was amazed when a young man walking past said, hello, Sheila. He could tell it was me even without my disguise. I think I said to him, how did you know it was me? Then, of course, the next stage for me was to cut my hair to chin length and so on. I was hugely influenced by the women's liberation movement. It made me who I am today. And the first effect of it was that I abandoned harmful beauty practices. Um, men, of course, don't have to do these things. They can be barefaced, but women are culturally required to wear, wear makeup. And that's why I had so much makeup on in this picture. Now, after this great and wonderful women's liberation movement, when women were generally abandoning all of these practices, there was a massive back backlash. In the 1990s, the back, there was a considerable backlash against the movement. And there was the invention of something, for instance, called third wave feminism, which turned out to celebrate prostitution and pornography and beauty practices and called them all choice. So in fact, there weren't feminism at all. In the 2000s, there were slut walks, which were supposed to be empowering to women because we could all dress up as sluts and, and celebrate our slutness. The backlash was long and it was profound. Now that a new wave of feminism is at last underway, it's taking place in a context in which the literature, the ethics, the political analysis of the women's liberation movement has been mostly erased. Dworkin is remembered, but not her analysis of beauty practices. Today's feminists tend to pick and choose and beauty practices are not on the agenda for abolition. As a result of the backlash, it's very hard now to find an alternative in popular culture to what I call the sadomasochist romance that is heterosexuality. 
This picture is Madonna. Uh, but it, I mean, there's so many thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of pictures that are exactly like this from all over the place that uh, it could, would it spoil for choice, really. Um, so this is the sadomasochist romance. Observe any heterosexual couple or group on nights out, and you will see stark differences between the men and the women that show their difference in status. It's hard for me to understand why the glaring humiliation of women and flaunted power of men is not immediately clear from looking at any heterosexual couple on a night out. It's extraordinary how this display of stark and vicious inequality has been so normalized that it passes all the time without remark. It's seen as completely normal and natural. I find it painful to have to see this sort of display and I do not understand why all women do not find it so, why all women are not humiliated by having to see this. The photo of Madonna shows the problem. She played a crucial role in the backlash that took place against feminism in the 1990s. She was promoted as a perfect role model for girls. And she's a perfect, yes, it is, as, as somebody's saying in the chat, it's a mild image. She's been doing extraordinary naked things now that she's 60, really extraordinary things. But yes, this is just an, a nice picture of her showing ordinary sadomasochism. She's a perfect illustration of the fact that heterosexuality is a sadomasochist romance in which power and subordination are eroticized as the motive force of the culture and certainly of heterosexual attraction. In this photo, she has absurdly crippling shoes in which she can barely stand. She's completely unstable. She did not have what is commonly understood to be a good thing, both feet on the ground. Neither of her feet is on the ground. The shoes place her in a powder pigeon position with her chest stick that sticks out and her spine is constantly struggling to achieve a kind of balance. In the set of masochist romance, Madonna's male part is fully clothed, both his feet are on the ground, he does not look to be in pain. Madonna is only half clad and her dress plays peekaboo with her breasts as if she's in a strip club. Of course she has makeup, her hair is long and bleached, the man's suit here is dignified, it's not figure hugging, comfortable, can easily, can easily conceal body fat, he doesn't need a corset, it's the clothing of power. Such a display, and this is entirely normal today, raises the question of how heterosexuality could ever possibly be a sexuality of equality. It demonstrates well that women's sexuality under male domination is groomed to be the eroticizing of women's subordination and male sexuality, the eroticizing of dominance. What else could happen between these two? Certainly not a sexuality of equality when one is half naked and can hardly move. Now, this is Nancy Pelosi crippled at work. She's in her 80s. Um, today, the wearing of crippling shoes is normal for elite women amongst whom I include top politicians, politicians' wives, such as Brigitte Macron, pop culture celebrities, television presenters, news readers. They set the tone and they are the role models for girls. Here, Nancy Pelosi is almost unable to walk, but determined to wear these crippling shoes whilst performing the duties of her work. She may be unable at this point to wear flat shoes or walk easily because crippling shoes do cripple in the long run. And in the end, many women are unable to walk in any shoes but these shoes and cannot otherwise walk at all. She's now in her 80s, she's thin. She would likely suffer serious injury if she fell, but as she hobbles about, a fall looks very likely and it alarms me and doubtless others too. I cannot relax and I am sure she cannot. It's completely extraordinary that there should be this performance and look at the difference between her and any of the other men who are in this screen. Nobody is having to humiliate themselves in this fashion. So I will conclude. Transvestism has always been a product of the hatred of women, the exploitation of women's oppression for men's satisfaction, but it's not new. I've read a great deal of the psychological and criminological literature about transvestism from the late 19th century onwards. It was always a practice deeply insulting to women, and doubtless often traumatic for these men's wives. But the men were ashamed of it, and for decades it was illegal for men to cross-dress in public. They dressed in their bedrooms or bathrooms, went away for cross-dressing weekends, and read their cross-dressing fan club magazines in private. It was only in the 1990s that transvestite activists created a liberation movement for the expression of their sexual fetish. It is not possible to dismantle the edifice, the edifice that transvestites have created, 
unless we attack the notion of gender that founds male domination. The notion of gender that underlies the transvestite movement is that men and women are in some fashion fundamentally different. Different in a way which causes women to like to be exposed in public and to walk in tame, whereas men just naturally do not. It is the culture and politics of male domination that construct transvestism, and this culture needs to be overturned, completely transformed. Dworkin analyzes beauty in her book, Woman Hating, as just one aspect of the way women are hated in male supremacist culture. And she indicts woman hating culture for the deaths, violations, and violence done to women, and says that feminists must look for ways of destroying culture as we know it, rebuilding it as we can imagine it. I think the word destroying is strong. It's a good word. It's a crucial word. We're not talking about tinkering at the edges of culture. Tinkering at the edges will not do. We have to bring down the idea of natural masculinity and femininity. They are the behaviors of the dominance of the missive classes, not something created by biology and not something caused by choice. Meanwhile, whenever I write or speak about these practices of subordination at this time, there are many women who are affronted. There are women who say, why on earth do we have to talk about this sort of thing when we're facing an existential threat? Can't we just talk about what is important? Some say that I'm criticizing them and that is woman hating. Although of course, I'm not criticizing any individual women. I have no idea most of the time what any of them are wearing when I am talking. I'm making a political analysis. I understand why they say these things, but I do not think their sensibilities can be protected from feminist theory. It is crucial that we do an analysis of beauty practices, even if there are women who get quite upset by that criticism. If the culture of misogyny is not overturned, transvestism will continue. It might be shoved out of the public eye as it was before, though that is hard to even imagine now. But men will engage in this behavior as long as women are required to wear a uniform which demonstrates our subordinate status. And as long as the new wave of feminism determinedly omits the criticism of beauty practices from their analysis. Somebody was saying it's lovely to see women defeminize. And I think we were so excited <coughs> about defeminizing in the 70s and what it did for us that I can remember I had a party in my flat in Putney in the late 70s, which we, I called a before and after party. We'd all defeminized. And we all had short hair and so on and so on. So, on. Um, so women all brought two photos. One of the photos was of them before they defeminized, so that uh, being getting married or out at a party when they were heterosexual and 19 or whatever. And so we put the uh, photos on the walls, the, the before photos on one wall and the after photos on other walls. And it, the job was to match them up. It was absolutely mm -hmm. hilarious, of course. Everybody had hysterics and fell about uh, because everybody looked so extraordinarily different. And we all looked so extraordinarily absurd to our new feminist eyes in the very strange costumes we'd worn before. So I do advise this as a practice, as you are defeminizing, as I know so many of you are and so many of you will have before and after parties for the laughs. It's really worthwhile. It's really worthwhile. But one of the thing I things I did notice was that a couple of the comments in the chat, women are saying, yes, but not this or not that sort of beauty practice, or are they giving the impression that we, you know, we don't have to be wholesale in our abolition of beauty practices and our opposition to them. So you can have a little bit of inequality um, on women and women can choose to do a little bit of showing their inequality. I don't think that's okay, really. I know women probably feel um, very much that they need to see this because they're determined not to stop wearing the makeup or whatever it is that they do. But honestly, I was trying to say we actually need to destroy the culture and we have to get rid completely of agenda. I don't want a bit of it. As I said, fiddling around the edges won't do it. So that's all I've really got to say is that it's amazing how over and over again women say just a little bit. Can I have a little bit of inequality on my face, on my feet? I don't really think that's on. So thank you, everyone, for listening.